Walking with God. It's the great invitation and call that God places on us. And as we're looking at this book and seeing each of the five sections, they all relate to this theme of what it means to be walking with God. And we're now in the fourth section of the book that communicates that walking with God is a cooperative work between God and man. God calls us to be his own. He chooses us. He's provided the opportunity for us to understand, to know the gospel, to experience conviction through the Holy Spirit. But just because God elects or chooses us doesn't mean we're automatically saved. The other side of the equation is that we have to personally and individually respond to the gospel message. And as we place our trust in Jesus, that completes the cooperative work that provides for our salvation. Now, as we're working through Romans 9, 10, and 11, each of these chapters is filled with great big theological truths. And in fact, this, this section is so, it is the most challenging part of the entire book of Romans. And some would even say that this section that we're going through now is possibly the most challenging and controversial of the entire New Testament. And that's why, as I shared with you two weeks ago, this is also the most avoided passage when pastors are teaching through this, because it is so challenging. And it is so much easier just to stop at the end of chapter 8 and, oh, isn't it wonderful? The Holy Spirit's at work transforming us. And then we pick up in chapter 12, where we start talking about how we relate to one another in the church. And it's easy to just kind of sidestep this whole section. But we're not going to do that. It's challenging, but we're going to tackle it. We're going to go through this, because this is, this is God's word, okay? So today, we're just focusing on the first five or six verses. And follow along with me as I put them on the screen, or you have your Bibles open. And Paul writes in verses one through five, with Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ. I would give up my salvation if that would save them. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Amen. Wow. Paul starts right out of the chute saying, this is so important to me. Now, a couple weeks ago, I gave you this kind of flyover overview of everything that's covered in Romans 9 through 11. To help you understand where we're going today, I want you to just imagine that every one of us own 66 acres of land. 66, because that's how many books are in the Bible, all right? And we all have all of this land, and we want to build a house. We figure out, here's the best place to have a house and the land. And now before we start building the house, we have to have a floor plan. That floor plan is critical to the success of the building. Are we going to have a ranch or are we going to have a two-story house? Is it going to have a basement or is it going to be on a slab? And you cannot start building a house without a clear understanding, a philosophical hermeneutic of construction that will help us say, okay, the house is going to be solid, the house will stand, the house is going to meet our needs. And the same thing is true when we come to the scriptures where there can be some interpretational differences. We have to have a floor plan. We have to know how we're approaching 
this house that we're about to build. And as we're looking at Romans 9 through 11, and I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, the critical floor plan is dependent on how we're going to approach this passage and whether we're going to see it as being figurative or if we're going to understand it literally. Is it figurative or literal? And as you study in Christendom, you see the church is divided in how to approach this passage. In this entire section, now I've shared with you, covenant theology uses a floor plan that sees everything that we're going to be talking about today as being figurative. Everything is a picture of the church. And then dispensationalists use a floor plan that represents a literal interpretation of the passage. And our church and the way that I communicate teaching the Bible is based in a literal understanding of everything that we're going to be looking at today and over the next several weeks as we're working from both 9, 10, and even into 11, and especially 11. There are some important reasons, and these are so foundational that as we're jumping into chapter 9 today, we have to make sure that we have a clear floor plan, that we know what we're doing as we're building this house of understanding. Why is it so critical for us to approach this passage from a literal rather than a figurative understanding? And this morning, I want to share three reasons As Paul is communicating this very important section of theology, of prophecy, of understanding as it relates to Israel, the church, and mankind as a whole. Three reasons why we approach this and understand it literally. And the first is because of the very context of everything that Paul is writing. His concerns are all about national Israel. In every chapter, he keeps coming back to this point of Israel. Israel, not the church, but his national, relational family of Israel. In chapter 9, verse 2, we just read, Paul said, I have great sorrow, unceasing anguish, not for the church, but for my people, the people of my own race, national Israel. He says, I'm overwhelmed with burden for them. Now, this is really interesting because it picks up on the argument that Paul was making clear back in chapter 3 when the question came up, what advantage is there to being a Jew, to being a member of Israel? What value is there in identifying with Israel as they characterize it by circumcision? Is there any value in being a part of national Israel, and he says, absolutely, much in every way. And then he starts to explain why national Israel is so blessed. First of all, they're the ones that were given the very words of God. Now, it's really interesting because he starts into the list of explaining why there's an advantage to being a part of national Israel. But then it's almost like the Holy Spirit distracts him and says, now, before you give any more ideas of why it's an advantage to be a part of Israel, here's where we're going. In chapter 3, 4, 5, and 6, all focus on the issues of faith. And then all of a sudden we come back to chapter 9. And it's as if Paul is going back and says, what advantage is there to being a part of national Israel? Well, they've been entrusted with the very words of God. And, and now the list continues. Theirs is the adoption of sons. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and theirs is the human ancestry of Christ. Oh, it's all about national Israel. Paul sets the context for everything that he's going to start, and he begins with national Israel. In chapter 10, we have exactly the same thing as Paul is describing national Israel. And he says, dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. Can't be referring to the church. It's about national Israel. His brothers, his sisters, his tribe that needs to be saved. 
We see exactly the same thing at the beginning of chapter 11. He says, I ask then, did God reject his people? Has God abandoned Israel? By no means. And to make sure that we understand, we're talking about national Israel, not spiritual Israel, not the church. He says, I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. But then he goes on and he says, God did not reject his people. God has not thrown Israel to the side. God foreknew them. He forechose them with purpose. All right. So we understand that Paul sets the context for everything that we're going to look at between 9 and 11. And now the big question is, when we're talking about Israel, the focus is on Israel, are we focusing primarily on national Israel versus spiritual Israel? And there is a distinction. And Paul writes and says, I want you to understand the distinction between national and spiritual Israel. He starts in verse 6, and he says, it's not as if God's word has failed. Now, the NIV is a great translation, but sometimes the NLT, the New Living Translation, translates these verses with just a little bit more clarity and understandability for us. When the NIV says, it's not as if God's word has failed. The NLT says in a question, in the form of a question, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? That's a critical point. Just because Israel has messed up and they rejected God, has God utterly rejected them and he's thrown his promises away for Israel? And then this important point of distinction comes up. Not everyone who are descended from Israel are Israel. And that gets a little confusing. Not everyone descended from Israel are Israel. And essentially what Paul is saying is not everyone who is born into national Israel are truly members of spiritual Israel. And he gives us the example from a national physical perspective. And he says, just because people are descendants of Abraham doesn't necessarily mean they're all Abraham's children of promise. It, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And this is a very important point from a family, national, physical perspective. The NLT puts it this way. The scriptures say that Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. It's through the descendants of Isaac that people will be considered part of Israel. Even though Abraham had other children. All right, we got to put the pause button on for a second and go back to Genesis. Abraham and Sarah wanted a child. They tried for years and years and years. Finally, Sarah came up with this plan. She said, okay. It is absolutely legal and cultural that since I can't have kids, you can take my handmaid, my servant, Hagar. You can have a baby with her, and that baby will legally be mine. And so Abraham said, okay. And he went along with this, and he and Hagar got together, and they had a son named Ishmael. And God said, Abraham. It may be culturally appropriate, but it's not my plan. You and Sarah are going to have a miraculous birth of a son. His name's going to be Isaac, and that's the child of promise. Now, what's interesting is that it wasn't just an issue of Ishmael versus Isaac. Long after that, when Sarah died, Abraham remarried. Here's this guy, 125 years old. Sarah dies, and he remarries, and he has more kids. And we find out that neither is Ishmael or any of the other children born later going to be a part of the promise. Only Isaac. Only Isaac. So you have one child of promise, even though there are many children of Abraham. 
That's important. It's going to illustrate the principle of spiritual Israel versus national Israel. In other words, in verse 8, or in the same way, it's not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it's the children of promise. Promise is such a critical word to this whole study. It's the children of promise, the descendants of Isaac, who are regarded as Abraham's national offspring. Okay, so there is no descendant of Ishmael, and there is no descendant of any other children that were born to Abraham that are considered Jews. They're not Israelites from a national perspective. Only the descendants of the promise Isaac can be called a Jew. We all understand that. So from a national perspective, national Israel includes all of the physical descendants of Abraham and Isaac who are descendants of promise. Right? That makes sense? So what's the difference between national Israel and spiritual Israel? Well, national Israel are only the Jewish people who are descended from Abraham and Isaac. Spiritual Israel includes all the descendants of Abraham from a faith perspective who believe the redemptive covenant promise. Again, there's the word promise that God gave first to Adam and then to Abraham. See, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they chose to rebel against God, plunging everybody in the world into sin, God came to Adam and Eve and gave them a promise and said, there's going to be a redeemer that's born, the seed of the woman. Now, that is the only clear promise of salvation that we have all the way from the time of Ab from Adam to Abraham. And in the Old Testament, everyone was saved by believing that redemptive promise. But then, years and years and generations later, God calls Abraham and says, I want you to follow me. I want you to come with me on this journey of faith that we looked at in chapter 4 of Romans, and I'm going to take you to a promised land. And as part of the covenant promises that God made to Abraham, he said, you're going to have seed. You're going to have a redeemer. Now, when you read in Genesis 12 and 15, the seed sounds like just all the different descendants. But Paul takes that promise in Galatians and makes it clear that the fulfillment of that promise of a descendant, a promise of a seed, was Jesus. Jesus. And Abraham believed that promise so much so that when Jesus was interacting with the Pharisees in the book of John, there is this point where they're having a conversation, and he said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. He celebrated it. And the Pharisees look at Jesus and they say, what do you mean? How do you know that Abraham was celebrating you? You're not even 50 years old. How can Abraham have celebrated you? And Jesus said, before Abraham was ever born, I was already God. I am. They wanted to kill him for that. But Abraham knew that Isaac was just a picture of the great Redeemer, the miraculous one that would be born. And for everyone who embraces, they're not just part of national Israel, but they embrace the covenant promise of redemption that began with Adam and Eve and then was communicated to Abraham and then on for centuries to follow. Every single person who believed the covenant redemptive promise became part of spiritual Israel. And when you get to chapter 11, Paul says, all right, this is the way it's going to look. This is the promise of God. I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Israel, national Israel, has experienced a hardening in part right now. Until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Right now, we see a few people who are Jewish in heritage, national heritage, who are coming to faith and becoming part of spiritual Israel. That's amazing. But 
the church as a whole, the bulk of Christians today are Gentile believers. But Paul is absolutely clear. There's coming a day when God's going to say, okay, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and now it's time to turn my attention back to Israel as a whole. And when the full number of the Gentiles has gotten saved and come into the church, and now they participate in the promises of spiritual Israel, now God is going to turn to the rest of the nation of Israel. We know that there are about 18 million people who are Jewish today, national Jews. In Israel, there are 30,000 people who are Jewish Christians. 18 million Jews. We also know from the prophecies of the Old Testament that during the tribulation period, two-thirds of all the Jews who are alive are going to be put to death. But one-third is going to be saved. And at the climax of the tribulation period, the enemy is going to come against Israel, and they're going to cry out to God for deliverance and help. Jesus is coming back, and they will see their Messiah, Redeemer, and Israel, all of that six million that still survived the tribulation period are going to in mass put their trust in Jesus. And all Israel will be saved. All of their surviving, remaining Israelites, Jewish people who survived the tribulation period are going to be saved. And this is the fulfillment of the great promise that God gave Israel in Isaiah 59 when he said, the deliverer will come from Zion and he's going to turn godlessness away from Jacob. He's not talking about the church there. He's talking about national Israel. There's going to be this universal, if we can use that word, this universal moment of realization and redemption for Israel. Now, to be clear, when we read the verse it's in verse 26, and you all know I'm colorblind. I don't even know what color that is. I just know it's brighter than everything else. When in verse 26, it says, all Israel will be saved. That represents all of the remaining surviving Jewish people at the end of the tribulation. But if you're using the floor plan of figurative interpretation, John Calvin looks at this reference to Israel in verse 26 in Calvin, representing covenant theology, says, I extend the name of Israel, not just to national Israel in this verse, but to all the people of God. He's saying that in verse 26, when it says all Israel will be saved, that's the church. That's the church. But it's interesting that John Stott, who is not a dispensationalist, he comes from a covenant background, but as he's studying this passage, John Stott says it is ex exegetically, exegetically impossible to give to Israel in this verse any other name, any other denotation than that which belongs to the term throughout the rest of the chapter. And Every time that Paul has used the term Israel in chapters 9, 10, and 11, it, it keeps coming back to national Israel, national Israel, national Israel. You can't get away from it. I, I don't care how you try to massage it. You can't get away from the fact that the context that Paul is writing in the next three chapters is about national Israel, and the focus is on them. The church is included later, but the focus is primarily on national Israel. Okay? And Paul is making it clear that the gifts and the calling of God for Israel are irrevocable. God is a promise-keeping God. And all of the promises that he's given to Israel are still going to be fulfilled. And right away, somebody's, you know, and I've had people ask as we've started this, when we think in terms of the promises that God has made, irrevocable promises, unconditional promises that we read about right here in the verses that we just looked at, when the full number of Gentiles has come in, 
God says, I promise I'm coming back to Israel. My focus will be on Israel. Israel's going to be saved. There's going to be, there's going to be redemption and restoration for national Israel. <sighs> okay, then the question that we have to ask in order to properly understand and interpret this is, are there any promises that were uniquely given to national and spiritual Israel that cannot be applied to the church? This is absolutely critical for us to be able to properly understand and have a framework for approaching this passage. Did God promise anything to national Israel that he did not promise to the church? And the answer is yes. Yes. In fact, there are four promises that God gave to national Israel that can't be fulfilled in the church. They were given to Israel. The first is that they are going to completely return to the land. God allowed them to be spread out across the world, and they are coming back to Israel. To Israel. Zechariah 10, Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 31, Jer uh, Ezekiel 34, all of these prophecies were given to Israel specifically that I'm going to bring you back from all the different countries where you've been spread out and this is going to be your land. And they are going to have everlasting possession. That promise wasn't given to the church. It was given to Israel. Zechariah 10 and Amos 9 are clear. If you have a literal understanding and you don't try to spiritualize it, this was promised to the nation of Israel. And Israel has never experienced the fulfillment of that promise yet. On the screen, you have on the right side this map. And I know it's small, but there is a blue line that goes around the map that represents all of the land that was promised to Israel. Not the church, but Israel. And while Israel has lived at different times in these various parts of the land, they have never yet fully controlled it. And God says, I'm going to keep this promise. In Amos chapter 9, you see that God is bringing them back. He's going to settle them in the land that he promised them. The time is coming, and I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from the distant lands, and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again, and I will firmly plant them there in their own land. He is not talking about the church. He's talking about the descendants of Abraham. I am going to give them the land that I promised, and they will never again be uprooted from the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God, the strongest name of God that we find. We have a promise-keeping God. And he's going to fulfill all of his promises to Israel. He's going to bring them back to the land. He's going to give them the land for their everlasting possession. The third is that there is going to be a spiritual revival across the country. In Isaiah 59, Jeremiah 31, Zechariah 13, it all speaks of the fact that the remaining Israelites are going to come to faith in Jesus. They will see him as their Messiah. They're going to be confused in Zechariah 13. Where did you get those wounds? He said, from a house of a friend. And they're going to realize this is Jesus, their Messiah, who is a nation they have rejected for centuries. But everyone who is of Israelite birth and heritage is going to come to faith in that moment. And there will be spiritual revival. And then on top of that, there's going to be a national honor a national honor that is given to Israel and no one else, no one else. There's no way that the church can fulfill this. Look, in Zechariah chapter 8, people from the nations of the world, nations, cities around the world will travel to Jerusalem and the people of one city will say to the people of another, come on, let's go to Jerusalem and ask the Lord to bless us. And in those days... Ten men from different nations and languages of the world will clutch at the sleeve of one Jew. Not the church member, 
It's the Jew. It's been restored to a place of honor. They will clutch the sleeve of a Jew and they will say, please let us walk with you because we've heard that God is with you. It's a promise that was given to Israel, not the church. Now look, even the disciples anticipated this. After three years with Jesus, now Jesus is resurrected from the grave. He's ready to return to heaven. The disciples are all with him. And they all wait one big last question before you go. Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus looked at him and said, you guys are nuts. I've been with you three years and you don't get it yet. There is no future for Israel, right? No, no. He didn't say, oh, all those promises have been transferred. Israel's going to come under destruction and they'll never be picked up again. Look, Jesus was clear about the destruction of Jerusalem and their rejection. When Jesus was coming to Jerusalem that last time, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I've wanted to gather you together like, like a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you wouldn't have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. Yes, there was judgment. Yes, there was destruction. But God didn't change his mind about Israel. Jesus didn't say, oh, you should have known that Israel was going to come under judgment and I was going to take all those great covenant promises that I made to you and I'm just going to hand them to the Gentile church. Instead, he said, it's not time yet. It's not for you to know the time or the season that the Father has chosen, but it'll happen. It'll happen. All right. This floor plan for our house is so important in understanding how to approach this passage. Covenant theology teaches that you interpret the Old Testament based on the New Testament. And if that's true, or since it's true, then how about if we start with Romans 9 through 11 as ground zero? And we approach this and say, okay, without any other preconceived notions or theological opinions, what is the simple reality of what Paul is saying in Romans 9, 10, and 11 regarding the race of Israel, the promises that God made, and then let that be the passage by which we understand and interpret the rest of the Old Testament promises and prophecies. And if we do that, if we come and we say, okay, right now Israel is sidelined a little bit. God is building the church with predominantly Gentiles. It's the time when the fullness of the Gentiles is happening. When it comes, I'll turn back to Israel. All Israel is going to be saved because they're going to trust in Jesus. So if that's our framework, now we've got to come up with a way to say, all right, then if we're using Romans 9 through 11 as the basis for our understanding of Israelology, then what does that do for all the other promises that God gave Israel? The warnings, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. And if we're going to approach this from a literal perspective, acknowledging that there is a time when the fullness of the Gentiles is done and God is going to start working in Israel, and we go, okay, that is the foundational framework. We know that we're working with a, with a house that's a ranch on a slab, and this is the way it's going to be, then we go to the rest of the prophecies and say, how do they fit in then to this plan? Instead of imposing our plan on Romans 9 through 11, we say, if that's the case, and as you study through all of the promises and prophecies related to Israel, in both the Old and the New Testament, this is the only way it can work. I'm telling you. It's the only way it can work because you have in Daniel the promises and the prophecies of the tribulation period, seven years. That's what's going to come next. You have the promises and prophecies that there's going to be a millennial kingdom that 
Jesus is going to reign physically on earth for a thousand years. It's the only way it can happen. Covenant theology teaches that we're in the tribulation period right now. The church has been going on for 2,000 years, but the tribulation isn't a literal seven-year event. It's part of the church age right now. Covenant theology teaches that there isn't going to be a thousand-year physical visible reign of Jesus where the Jews are elevated and given that honor. They say that the millennium is happening right now. We say there's no way that we can make this work. You can't have a blueprint for a house on a slab and a blueprint for a house with a basement. It it doesn't work foundationally. And our blueprint in literal understanding says there is no other way to take all of the different promises that include both Israel and the church. We're not denying the church. Paul will get to his discussion of the church, but right now he's just focused on Israel. Is it getting deep in here? All right. Now, and to make sure that we understand the distinction in how Paul deals with both Israel and the church. The third reason why we approach this from a literal perspective is because over and over in all three chapters, Paul is writing, and it's God speaking, not just Paul writing his own theology. The Holy Spirit is speaking through Paul saying, all right, let's be clear. There are distinctions between Israel and the Gentile church. For example, in chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, after he's just finished talking about national Israel, he turns his attention to the Gentiles. And he says, concerning the Gentiles, God says in his prophecy of Hosea, those who were not my people, can't be talking about Israel, Can't be talking about the church. He's talking about Gentiles now. Those who were not my people, I now call my people. Because he's bringing Gentiles into faith and into relationship with him. I now call them my people, and I will love those people who I did not love before. God's love was primarily focused on Israel until he started bringing Gentiles into the church. Verse 26, then at the place where they were told, you are not my people, and now they're going to be called the children of the living God. He's making a clear distinction between Israel and Gentiles. We see this again in chapter 9, verse 30 through 32, where we have this distinction between Israel and the Gentiles who are coming into the church. And he says, even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they didn't have the law like Israel did. They were made right with God. And it was because of faith. It was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel, now he focuses on Israel again. Can't be the church. He's saying the people of Israel who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping Mosaic law, never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping Mosaic law instead of trusting in him. Clear distinction between Israel and the Gentile church. Chapter 10 does the same thing in verses 19 and 20. God says to Israel, I'm going to make you jealous. I'm going to make you envious by those who were not a nation. And he quotes the Old Testament prophet, I was found by those who didn't seek me. I revealed myself to those who didn't ask for me. Israel, the Gentiles. Chapter 11 does exactly the same thing and draws this dynamic distinction between Israel and the Gentile church. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they were looking for. They're not saved. A few have. The ones that God has chosen and responded by faith. But the hearts of the rest of national Israel was hardened. Now, here's the big question. Did God's people, national Israel, who rejected his invitation of salvation by faith and tried to earn salvation by keeping the law, 
Did God's people, national Israel, stumble and fall beyond recovery? Has God thrown them away and said, Ah, you guys, you weren't willing to listen to me. I am taking my irrevocable covenant promises away from you, and I'm just going to hand them to the Gentile church. And he answers the question, Of course not. Of course not. They were disobedient. They messed up. So, In that moment, God said, I'm going to make salvation available to the Gentiles. But he wanted his own people, national Israel. He wanted his own people to be jealous and want this and claim it for themselves. Now, look at this one. If the Gentiles were enriched because the people of God or the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, Gentiles started coming into the church. Gentiles predominantly fill the church because national Israel rejected God's promise of salvation. Oh, if the Gentiles had been blessed through their disobedience... How much more, how greater a blessing the world is going to share when they finally accept it. There's a day coming when Israel's going to turn to God, when they're going to trust in Jesus. And as you read throughout this section, in chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, over and over and over and over again, you have this clear distinction between religious, national Israel and the Gentile church. You can't get away from it. You can't deny it. All right. Do we need to get a cup of coffee at this point? All right. And I already know that somebody is sitting there going, Steve, this is so out there. This is so theological. I mean, After all, does it really matter? Does it really matter? If we come to faith in Jesus and we're saved, why do we need to focus on all of this? What makes this so important? And that's a great question. And I think it deserves an answer. Why are we bothering to go through this? Why not be like almost every other church that gets to the end of chapter 8, sidesteps 9 through 11, and then just goes to chapter 12? Let me give you three reasons why this matters, why we're going to plow through this together. Number one, it's because this is part of God's Word. This is part of God's Word. And All of the Bible is God-breathed, and it's been given to us so that we can grow spiritually. Correction, reproof, instruction, and righteousness. It's part of God's Word. And if God recorded it for us, He wants us to study it and embrace it. Number two, it reveals God's plans for the future. Now, this is so important when we read in verse 11, 25 of chapter 11. Brothers, sisters, I want you to understand, not just be aware of or tolerate the fact that there are some theological distinctions and differences from what your previous denomination might have taught you, but I want you to understand this mystery. The word mystery is so cool. In the first service, we sang this song, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. The word mystery in the Greek language literally means a previously unrevealed truth. The Holy Spirit is guiding Paul and what he's writing. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit makes this clear to Paul that no one had ever seen before. And he says, this is something that God wants us to understand, not sidestep. And so we're going to plow in. We've got our building plans. We understand what this house is supposed to look like as we unfold the scriptures. And this is God's plan for Israel, the church, and mankind. Now, 
from a theological perspective. This is really important. This is pretty cool that God chose to give us his word. He chose to reveal some things that there was no way we could have known other than this. Divine revelation. But can I just be honest and say that's kind of out here, the head knowledge stuff. We could go home right now and say, all right, we learned something because we studied God's word and it revealed his plans. But you know where it really makes a difference in our lives and why we're going to plow through this together? It's because it reveals God's character. God's character. Israel messed up bad. Israel messed up bad. But in chapter 3, Paul says, what if some of national Israel they didn't have faith? They weren't faithful to God. Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Just because they messed up, is God going to take all those irrevocable, eternal covenant promises that he made to Israel and just say, forget it. I'm just going to give them to the Gentiles. You have no future left. (laughs) He said, no, no, not at all. The NLT translation, some of them were unfaithful. Some of them did mess up. But just because they were unfaithful, just because they messed up, does that mean that God's going to be unfaithful to his irrevocable calling and covenant promises? Of course not. Of course not. And based on everything that Paul is writing, in Romans 9 through 11, God declares in an irrevocable eternal promise that there's going to be a future for Israel. And Joshua puts voice to that by saying, not one of all the good promises God has made to the house of Israel ever failed or ever will. Everyone was fulfilled and everyone will be fulfilled. And someday, surviving national Israel will become spiritual Israel. And they're going to be able to say, every one of God's good promises were kept. Why does that matter to me? Why does it matter to you? Can I ask you, and I mean this really seriously, Would you raise your hand if sometime in the last week you messed up? Right? I did. How many of you mess up every day? (laughs) Some of you don't. (laughs) I mess up all the time. What hope do I have as a believer that... There isn't going to come a moment when I've messed up and God says, that's it, Steve, you're out. I'm taking this eternal covenant promise that I've made to you in the new covenant. I'm just going to give it to somebody else. I can't put up with your messing up anymore. But if God looks at Israel with all of its messing up and says, no matter how much you've messed up, I'm not going to break my eternal promise to you. It sure gives me hope. God's character is as solid in his love for me and his willingness to accept me. Doesn't mean I can live any way I want. But it means that even when we mess up, God is going to stay faithful. God is going to keep his eternal covenant-making promises. He is a promise-keeping God, and I rest in his character because he's already proven it and said, this is what's going to happen with Israel, so you can trust that I will do it for you too. And that becomes the fulfillment of Psalm 145, verse 13, when the psalmist says, Oh, Lord, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations, and the Lord is faithful to all of his promises and loving towards all he has made. I am so grateful that I was included in that all he has made. And you are too.
If you've placed your trust in Jesus, if you've been a, become a part of his great spiritual kingdom, God has given you incredible, wonderful promises. He'll never leave you. He'll never take the salvation away. You will live with him forever in glory, and you can count on that. You can absolutely count on it because God is a promise-keeping God. And his promises, his gifts, his calling are irrevocable. Irrevocable. If you've messed up yesterday, today, already today, aren't you glad that we have a promise-keeping God? Can't you just say, Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray.